Hey, welcome to our YouTube channel or a podcast. My name is Tyler and I serve as the Ridge's online campus pastor. And right now at our campus in Greenfield and on live.theridgecc.com, we are wrapping up one of our biggest and best series of the year called At The Movies. At The Movies is a message series where we take movies and we use them to illustrate truths from the Bible to help all of us just take our next step to follow Jesus. Now, due to copyright laws, we cannot post these movies on demand or on our YouTube channel or on our podcast like most weekends. And so I want to invite you to join us for At The Movies at our physical location in Greenfield to get the full experience. You can also catch At The Movies messages during one of our services online on our website at, and our TV apps. And you can get all the details for that on our website, theridgecc.com. But since you're on our YouTube channel or you're listening to our podcast, we wanted to do something extra for you during our At The Movie series. That is, we're walking you through a series that's addressing questions that many of us have, but we aren't sure how to ask or talk about it. And so this series is called Strange Things. Over the last few weeks, we've asked questions like, well, why are we fascinated with the supernatural? Are we living in an unseen world? Are we living in the end times? And if you missed any of those parts, you can actually visit our Strange Things playlist on our YouTube channel to catch up. Now today, we're wrapping this up uh, by hearing from author and pastor John Burke. John has written the best-selling book called Imagine Heaven, where he describes examining over a thousand near-death experiences, and he compared them to each other. And the things he discovered are fascinating. So go ahead and watch what John Burke has to share. And if you like this video at all, please give it a thumbs up, share this video with a friend, and then subscribe to our YouTube channel as we will kick off a brand new series called The Most Important Thing. All right, let's head over to John Burke. so much. It's great to be here in Milwaukee. Mark uh, picked me up at the airport, took me straight to eat cheese curds. I didn't know there was such a thing. I don't have to imagine heaven anymore. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Still feeling the cheese curds. Well, three guys were sitting around uh, playing poker one night, and the subject of what happens when you die came up. And one of them said, hey, what do you want people to say at your funeral? And the first guy said, I want people to say I was a brilliant surgeon who saved many lives. And, and the second guy said, I want people to say that I was a dedicated family man who loved my kids and my wife well. And the third guy say, said, I want people to say, look, he's moving. <laughs> now, believe it or not, more and more, they're saying, look, he's moving. With modern resuscitation techniques, modern medicine's bringing more and more people back from what's called clinical death. And it's not a small number of people. Do you know that the Gallup poll found that one out of 25 people, that's 13 million Americans, have had what's called a near-death experience, where their hearts stopped beating, even brainwaves ceased in some cases. They were clinically dead, yet they came back to talk about what they experienced, a life to come. And now, this isn't brand new. Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, the widow's son. And if you're willing to consider what the Bible says, and now even what modern medicine is showing us, this life doesn't end with death. It can be the beginning of the most exhilarating life ever. Now, uh, nearly 35 years ago, I didn't believe any of that. <laughs> I was a skeptic. I didn't know what I believed about God, Jesus, the afterlife. I just believed in the next party. But my dad was dying of cancer. And I saw a book that he was reading on his nightstand called Life After Life. It was the first book on near-death experiences. I picked it up. I read it cover to cover in one night. And I said, oh my gosh, this God stuff may be real. 
And the next year, I was invited into a, a home Bible study, and I went to it and asked all my questions and wrestled for eight months, and I came to faith. Now, fast forward, I went from a career in engineering, ultimately into the ministry, and my wife and I started this church, went to seminary. At the same time, over the last 30 or so years, I've studied close to 1,000 near-death experiences. And I wrote Imagine Heaven for two reasons. One, to help skeptics like me see how real God is, how wonderful he is, and how wonderful the life to come is, but also to help Christians imagine heaven. Because, you know, Colossians 3.1 commands us to set our minds on things above, not on things of the earth, to, to imagine heaven. Now, let me just say, I'm skeptical about any one uh, claim of near-death experience, and here's why. Because what I realized studying a thousand of them is that they're all interpreting an experience that truly is hard to put into words. So they're having to interpret it in their own framework, in their own way. It's kind of like this. Imagine if we lived on this flat screen, all right? So this is Earth, but it's two dimensions, not three, and it's black and white, not in color. Now, death just means separation. When we die, whoever we are is separated from our physical body. So imagine at death, you're ripped off of that flat two-dimensional screen, and suddenly you're brought out into this room of three dimensions in color, and you're able to look back and see that flat black and white world for what it really is. It's, it's a part of this bigger world, but you're more alive than ever before. And then imagine you have to go back into the flat black and white screen and explain in flat two-dimensional black and white terms what a three-dimensional world of color is like. That, I'm convinced, is what these people are trying to do. Now, I include about 120 of their stories in Imagine Heaven, but I brought four of them with me today. Very credible people. Uh, a doctor, a medical doctor, a college professor, a commercial airline pilot, a pastor. I mean, people who don't need to go make up crazy tales to make money, and in fact, it hurt their career making this, talking about this, and yet they say it's true. So watch this. Dr. Mary Neal is an orthopedic surgeon who shares her medical practice and her love for outdoor adventure with her husband, Bill. In 1999, they planned an adventure that took Mary on a spiritual journey few have taken and returned to talk about. My husband and I really enjoy kayaking. We enjoy traveling. We speak Spanish. We've traveled internationally a number of times. And so for my husband's birthday, I said, okay, this is the year we're, we're gonna do it. So we went to Chile for a vacation to kayak. After a week of kayaking, Bill sat out the final day with a sore back. Mary and the rest of their group kayaked through a treacherous stretch of the river. These are drops of 10 to 15 feet, 20 feet maybe, which for an experienced kayaker is not a crazy thing. I went over the main drop and as I crested over the drop, I could see the tremendous turbulence and tremendous volume. And as I hit the bottom of the drop, the front end of my boat became pinned. I and my boat were immediately and completely submerged. I was absolutely pressed to the front deck of the boat. And I couldn't move my arms even back far enough to reach my spray skirt, let alone push myself out. I very sincerely asked that God's will be done, and I meant it. After several minutes of searching, the group leaders realized Mary was trapped under the falls. They came out on the rocks and they kept trying to get to the boat, but the force and the volume of the water was such that they just kept being flushed through. I mean, they just couldn't get to me. At one point, they sort of recognized that it was really turning into body recovery. Uh, not so much of a rescue. I know I've been underwater too long to be alive, yet I feel more alive than I've ever felt. And this is more real than anything I've ever experienced. And Dr. Neal was dead for 30 minutes, and yet she said she felt more alive than she had ever felt before. And this is common. Imagine that, that time that you feared most, the end of your life, and yet you leave your body because they say you're out of your body, but you still have a body. And that's the first commonality that I found. 
But you don't just have five senses. It's more like you have 50 senses. You feel more alive than you've ever felt before. And what people said is that because they had initially, they leave their body, but they stay in the realm of where they are, they can see the resuscitation attempt taking place and can even describe it. And in chapter two of Imagine Heaven, I write about skeptical doctors in the afterlife, how many skeptical doctors were convinced because of what people said they saw while they were out of their body. For instance, cardiologist Dr. Michael Sabum is someone I interviewed. He actually set out to disprove near-death experiences. He said this, he said, before talking to Pete, one of his patients, and scores like him, I didn't believe there was such a thing as a near-death experience. Pete told me he'd left his body during his first cardiac arrest and had watched my resuscitation attempt. When I asked him to tell me exactly what he saw, he described the resuscitation with such detail and accuracy that I could have later used the tape to teach physicians. He said, these people like Pete Morton saw details of the resuscitation they could not otherwise have seen if they weren't out of their body. One patient noticed the physician who failed to wear scuffs over his white shoes during open heart surgery. In many cases, I was able to confirm the patient's testimony with medical records and hospital staff. And Dr. Sabum studied these for five years, trying to disprove them, ends up changing his mind. He writes an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA. Uh, a radiation oncologist, Dr. Jeffrey Long, reads this in JAMA and says, no, nah, there's no way this is true. But he starts to interview his patients. And this is one of the things that I found common as well. People are very reticent to come forward and talk about this experience because it's so real, it's hard to describe, and it's so personal, they, they don't want to be shut down and called crazy. And that's usually the response they get. But Dr. Long ends up studying a thousand of them or so, and he says this, by studying thousands of detailed accounts of NDEers, near-death experiencers, I found the evidence that led to this astounding conclusion. NDEs provide such powerful scientific evidence it's reasonable to accept the existence of an afterlife. What is it that's convincing him? In the Lancet, Europe's, Europe's uh, most famous medical journal, uh, they describe a, a time when a guy was brought into a hospital, into the ER in Holland. He'd had a cardiac arrest, and he was unconscious. And they bring him in, and, and they're about to shock him, but first they had to intubate him, so they took the nurse found dentures, took the dentures out of his mouth, put it in the lower drawer of the crash cart. They shocked him, got his heart going again, but he never became conscious in the ER. They took him out to another room. Two weeks later, he, he or one week later, he becomes conscious, said that he could see everything going on in the ER, that he was out of his body. He could describe the nurses and doctors who was there and could tell them where they could find his lost dentures in the lower drawer of the crash cart. And that's where they found it. Now, there are many stories like this. And actually, I believe they go way back. In fact, I think the Apostle Paul actually had a near-death experience when he got stoned to death in, in Lystra. Stoned to death with rocks, by the way. Just don't want to confuse anybody. <laughs> so it says this in, in Acts chapter 14. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. Now, personally, I wouldn't go back into the town where they just stoned me with rocks, right? But that was Paul. So he was dead, then he, get, then he resuscitates. But listen, he says this later in, in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, and he's talking about himself, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. I think he's pointing back to this experience. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Why doesn't he know? Because we're out of our physical body, but we still have a body. So, but I do know I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding they cannot be expressed with words, things no human is allowed to tell. See, when we leave this physical body, we still have a body. It's kind of like this is version 1.0. We get an upgrade to version 2.0. <laughs> Jesus actually has version 3.0, but we won't get into that. But Paul talks about this, I believe, in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness. They'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they're raised as spiritual bodies. And I get into it a lot more of what those bodies will be like, but here's what I want you to know. You'll be yourself. 
We'll be ourselves. In fact, you've never been yourself so much as when you first leave this body. With eyesight way beyond what we can experience now. With communication that is pure, thought to thought, heart to heart. With movement that's unlimited. That's what people say. More alive than you've ever felt before. In new dimensions. You know, isn't it strange? Because people have such horrible views of heaven. I mean, even Christians. I, I find talking to Christians, they, they think it's going to be an endless, boring church service. That sounds bad to me, and I'm a pastor, all right? <laughs> Everything in this life gets boring and frustrating. You know why? Because this isn't the life we were meant for. This is a short, temporary life. It's a time of choosing. But there is a place we were meant for, and it's better than you've ever imagined. In fact, I believe that this life is really the shadow of the real life to come. I think it even hints at that in Hebrews 8. It says, they serve in a system of worship, talking about Moses in the tabernacle, that's only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. So just think, if all the, that's on earth, all the beauty of earth is just a, a shadow of the real thing to come, imagine experiencing the beauty of heaven, beauty in new dimensions. That's another commonality. So after observing their lifeless body for a while, people say then they move through some call it a tunnel, some a pathway. They describe it differently. I kind of wonder if it's like a wormhole from our dimensions of time and space into God's expanded dimensions of time and space. But they come out oftentimes in this place of great beauty, not unlike earth, mountains and trees and flowers and forests, but truly in new dimensions, expanded dimensions. Kind of wonder if that's what Paul meant when he said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And you know, Isaiah had a vision of heaven. And, and in Isaiah 6, he, he says, the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In other words, all the beauty of earth points towards something that's true about God. Now, if that's true here on earth, why would we ever think that the beauty of heaven would be less than this? Since this earth, it's created by God, but this is the wounded creation, creation. This is the marred creation. That's also what it says in Romans chapter 8. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. See, this earth labors under famine and disease and death and destruction because it's not what God wants us to hold on to forever. We can't. But there is a place that is more real and more beautiful and more full of life that you have been prepared for. That's what you were meant for. Now, Don Piper was a, a pastor on his way back from a retreat crossing a bridge in a rainstorm when an 18-wheeler comes across, skids out of control, runs over the top of his car, smashing it flat. EMS came and pronounced him dead, and it took 90 minutes for them to get the jaws of life to cut him out. He said he didn't go through a tunnel. He said he was instantly there at the gates of heaven, and rushing toward him was this group of friends and relatives coming to greet him. Listen to how Don and Dr. Neal described the beauty of heaven. So take us back to that day. You saw the 18-wheeler come. What was the next memory you had? Well, I took my last breath on the bridge, and I was, uh, my next breath was at one of the 12 gates of heaven. I'm looking through the gates. I'm looking down the street. There is a river that flows from this, this throne or this hill that's high and lifted up. And I know that's the river of life because we're told that it flows from the throne of God. So uh, many of the things that we know and enjoy and love here uh, are visible there as well. Um, I would say this, and... and um, Heaven's never going to be less than this. It's always going to be more. Yeah. In heaven, it's all big. I mean, it, it so far transcends any words that we can happen 
that we could come up with here. If you want to talk about uh, uh, meadows and flowers and beauty, and if you want to talk about Did trees. Did you see that? Oh yes, they're just magnificent, except that they are so brilliant and so vivid as to really dis defy description. So you live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, one of the most beautiful places on earth. How did that compare to the, this beautiful path leading to heaven? One of the problems that I and most people had when they came back from a near-death experience is that even the most intense beauty here on earth, even the most intense love here on earth is very, very pale in comparison to the intensity of the love and to the intensity of the beauty in God's world. Everything was far more intense. The colors were beyond anything we could ever experience here. I mean, imagine how great to explore all of God's creation more than we've ever imagined. And you're not gonna do it alone because the other commonality is a relationship. Heaven was meant for relationship. You know, those who get a glimpse often see this welcoming committee of people like Mary did, like Don did. And, and, you know, why wouldn't we expect that? You know, Jesus said the most important thing is to love God first and then to love people second. So why, if, if God says this life is all about relationship, why would we ever think he would want to rip that apart? Now, we'll know each other. We'll have our histories as well. Heaven was meant for relationship. You know, Jesus said this, his last night on earth to his closest friends. He said, there's more than enough room in my father's home, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I'll come to get you, so you will always be with me where I am. Marv Besteman was a, a bank president who was having surgery uh, when, he, when he died from. And he said he had this welcoming committee, this welcoming party coming, uh, who consisted of friends and relatives. And he said, both of my friends were prayer warriors. We'd spent many hours praying together. I'm not sure if that's why God chose these two guys for me to see. They were significant to me in my spiritual life. Everyone I saw had been influential in shaping my life in some way. And then a woman who died giving birth said, I recognized my grandmother and a girl I had known when I was in school and many other relatives and friends. It was a very happy occasion, and I felt they had come to protect or to guide me. Now, a little word of warning here. Many of them say this welcoming committee they knew was there to protect them. They don't exactly know what from. But it's important to understand that these people are getting a peek into a small part of a vast world. And that's why you don't want to take a near-death experience and extrapolate to what the afterlife is like, because they're just seeing a little bitty part. It's, it's kind of like uh, Mount Rushmore. You know, everybody's seen this part of Mount Rushmore, right? But there's another side to Mount Rushmore that people haven't often seen. <laughs> it's not that pretty, is it? Seriously, though, uh, in Imagine Heaven, I point out an interpretive key I found is that most people said that there was a border or a boundary they knew they couldn't cross and still come back to this life. You'll hear one hint at it in a minute. In other words, whatever this is, this is not full biological death. So we can't extrapolate to say what's beyond biological death from near-death experiences. They can't tell us what the afterlife is like. But the Bible does. And what these do is they, paint, they give bits of color on this bigger framework, this bigger picture that the Bible has given us. And it shows us that what Jesus was saying is true. Even when he talked about this welcoming committee, he said, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Listen to how Dr. Neal talks about relationship in heaven. You're greeted by this welcoming Welcome. committee. Yes. What was it? That's what some it people was a welcoming talk about. Committee. I absolutely knew that they were there to welcome me and greet me and make me feel loved and comfortable. And I also knew that they were there to protect me. What's your sense of what relationship is like? Well, that's really clear because there is no doubt that the only thing that truly matters is loving God and being a window through which God's light can shine to this world. 
and loving each other. I absolutely think that people who are important in our life, and I'm not really sure what the right word is, but our life circle, and it may be relatives or it may be people that come into our lives for a very brief period of time and have a profound impact. Those may also be part of our, our life's neighborhood. Yeah. I was able to see many, again, people, angels, spirits, I'm not sure, very busy. And I don't know what they were doing. Inside the Inside, archway. they were all very busy. I don't know what they were doing, but they were doing something and clearly doing God's work. And so was it like a city bustling with light? Yes, Life or? it was bustling is a great word for it. When I arrived, there was this momentary acknowledgement and not cheering, but almost like fantastic, welcome. And this, this outpouring of love for me. And again, it was this profound sense of, wow, I, not only do I not deserve this, but it was this profound sense of uh, understanding that that is how each person is created. Mm. I mean, there are billions of us, but that is how much each God loves each special. person. Yes. We will be together. And love is what it's all about. And that's what people come back realizing. And we'll hug, we'll kiss, we'll play, we'll dance. It, it'll be life, not less life, more life. But the most important thing is to love God first. And what's fascinating is another commonality is that people see this God of light and love, and in his presence, they have a life review. Now, what I found amazing is how all around the globe, people I've studied see the same God of light. Those who know he's Jesus know he's Jesus. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And it, this light is brighter than the sun, but not hard to look at and so beautiful and so full of love. Now, it might shock some Christians to hear that, but you know, Revelation 1, 7 says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him will gaze on him. And in fact, you know that even blind people who have near-death experiences see and see him. In fact, I report three blind cases in Imagine Heaven. One of them was Vicki. She uh, had a, a, a fatal car accident and then was resuscitated. But she said she moves through this tunnel and she's adjusting to sight. She didn't know what it was at first. And she said she comes out of the tunnel on this place of grass, trees, and flowers, and a vast number of people that surrounded her in a place of tremendous light. And the light, Vicki said, was something you could feel as well as see. They described this light as also love and life. And she said, everybody there was made of this light, and I was made of light, and what the light conveyed was love. There was love everywhere. It was like love came out of the grass. Love came from the birds. Love came from the trees. It was incredible really beautiful and I was overwhelmed by that experience because I couldn't really imagine what light was like it's still a very emotional thing to talk about now here's what I found so fascinating blind people describe light of heaven coming out of everything but where would they ever get that idea they wouldn't hear that here light shines on things here right and yet they're describing what John in the book of Revelation and Isaiah as well talk about when it says the city, the city of God, the very city Mary and Don were just describing, has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the lamb, Jesus, is its light and the nations will walk in that light. And do you know Daniel also said in Daniel 12, uh, this is in 400 BC, he says the dead will rise up, some to everlasting light, some to shame and everlasting disgrace, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Fascinating. So Vicki sees two of her friends, Debbie and Diane, who had both been blind. She had grown up with them in the same house. They died when they were 9 and 11. Yet now she sees them, and they're in their prime, and they're whole, and they're healthy. 
And then she sees Jesus. And in Jesus' presence, she never wants to leave. And she knows it's Jesus. And she describes him. And she ends up describing him when she's back, still blind, when she comes back, just like you would think, except this man of light, but looks like you would think Jesus looks. In his presence, she gets a life review. And in the life review, she sees herself growing up with her two friends, Debbie and Diane. And when she comes back, she's able to describe how they moved and things they did she couldn't otherwise have seen. This life review, though, is fascinating because people all around the globe in the presence of this God that they know is God, and they feel unconditional love in his presence. He knows everything about them, every motive, every thought they've ever lived. And in his presence, it's like they relive their lives. But not just from their perspective. They experience it from the perspective of the people they interacted with and how they felt and how it impacted them as well. And it's demonstrating what Jesus said. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Paul said this, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, don't miss that last sentence. Receive their praise from God. See, the life review uh, is, is not judgment. That doesn't come till after the, the end of human history. It's, it's just foretelling what is going to happen. That we're all going to see our whole lives, and you'll know exactly, good and bad, what it is. And that's not for us to feel horrible about our lives. It's to realize we all needed forgiveness. We all needed what God claimed to do through Jesus on the cross that first Easter. And heaven is not something we earn. It's a gift that God gives anyone who wants it. And all we have to do is admit we needed what Jesus did. And in your life review, you'll realize it fully. But what God wants to do is say, but that's all paid for. All the bad's paid for. I want to reward you for every little act of kindness. Every good deed you did motivated out of love for me and love for people counted in his economy forever. Isn't that cool? The thing you need to know is it's never too late for any of us. You know, God is the God of the second chance. No one loves you more. But don't reject him. Because if you say, I don't want you, God, he'll give you what you want. You know, Howard Storm was a tenured college professor and an atheist who was taking students uh, on a trip through museums across Europe when in Paris, his lower duodenum ruptured. Normally, you can't survive five hours after that. He went into a hospital, but because it was a weekend in Paris, they couldn't find a surgeon. After nine hours, he passes. Now, Howard thought, when you die, it's just lights out, nothing. And yet, he said, he was standing there, and suddenly, he felt better than he'd ever felt before. He felt like Superman. One minute, he had felt the worst he'd ever felt, and now he feels great. And then there were these people in the hallway saying, come with us, Howard. And, and he said, we know who you are. And he thought it was the, the, the staff wanting to help him that they were going to finally lead him to surgery. He's not clear. He's dead. And he starts to follow them. Now, 23% of near-death experiences reported were hellish experiences. So you have to take that into account as well. And I write a whole chapter on that. And if Howard's experiences stop right there, he would have said, hey, it's all good. And yet these nice people lead him. And again, time doesn't work in the same way. It's like Peter said in 2 Peter 3, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And these people say that in near-death experiences. I don't know if it's an instant or a hundred years. I couldn't tell. Time, it doesn't work like that. And he follows them. And he doesn't know how long. And they lead him into this outer darkness, just like what Jesus described. And then they deceive him and turn on him. And any time I had interviewed him or talked to him about it, he has to stop. He said, I've had PTSD from that. I can't think about it. Because he hadn't crossed that border or that boundary, I believe he still had a chance to cry out to God. And from this hell, he remembers a song when a neighbor took him to Sunday school as a kid. Jesus loves me. It's all he could remember. And he desperately wanted that to be true. And he cries out, Jesus, if you are real, save me. 
And he said, into this outer darkness comes this light brighter than the sun, but not hard to look at. Arms reach out, pick him up, hold him as he bawls like a baby, realizing who this was. Take him out of there. And then in the presence of these angels with Jesus holding him, he gets a life review. Listen to how this former atheist professor talks about it. Howard, tell us about this life review that you had. There was a number of angels, I call them angels, who had been recording my entire life, all my life, and Jesus wanted them to play out in chronological order the scenes of my life. And the entire emphasis was on my interaction with other people, of course, initially starting out with my mother and father and my sisters and then, you know, school and friends and um, so you just, you saw it or you We saw it, we felt it. it, we experienced it. It was really interesting because it was, um, the whole emphasis was on people and not on things. Matter of fact, there were some instances where um, I had uh, won promotions, honors, awards, and they skipped them. And Jesus, I said to Jesus, uh, you're skipping the most important thing in my life. This is what I live for to get this award, Kentucky Artist of the Year. Big banquet in my honor and a big cash prize and everything. And uh, he said, that's not what we're here for you to see. That's not important. What I want you to see is how you treated the students. So what I learned in my life review was that um, the um, relationship with my father, I had participated in the breakdown of that relationship as much as he did. He was not a good father to me, and I resented it, and I was angry at him, so I did everything I could subconsciously and sometimes consciously to be as rebellious and as cold-hearted towards him as possible, which only aggravated him more and made him more of a hostile father. So the things that I had seen in my life that where I was the victim and everybody else was the bad guy, I came to find out. Um, it was a two-way street. We were both uh, playing this game. As my life progressed from my adolescence into my adulthood, I saw myself turning completely away from God, church, all that, and becoming um, a person who decided that life was all about um, the biggest, baddest bear in the woods wins. And now I began to experience Jesus and the angels literal pain. What do you mean? Emotional pain with watching scenes in my life. And like, here's the nicest, kindest, most loving being I've ever met, who I realize is my Lord, my Savior, even my Creator, holding me and supporting me, trying to um, give me more understanding of my life. And it was figuratively, not literally, like I was like stabbing him in the heart as we're watching this stuff. And the last thing I wanted to do was to hurt him. And I don't want to hurt him to this day. Uh, Jesus is a very feeling man. God is a very feeling creator. What were you seeing played out? I saw scenes where um, my sister was in bed crying and I got up in the middle of the night and went in and put my arms around her and hugged her. And Jesus and the angels were so filled with joy that I had been willing to do that, to try and um, you know, help her a little Comfort bit her. in her grief. But those were rare, the, uh, the scenes of my indifference. Just seeing, seeing people as objects in order to maneuver around through or you know, to shift to further my, my goals and my ambitions. We did go through a life review and it was nothing like I would have imagined. What, what my, was the life review like? My life was laid bare for all its good and bad. And one of the things we did was look at many, many, many events throughout my life that I would have otherwise called terrible or horrible or sad or bad or tragic. And instead of looking at an event in isolation or looking at how it impacted me and my little world, I had the most remarkable experience of seeing the ripple effects of the event when seen 25, 30, 35 times removed. You know, ima imagine seeing every little act of kindness, every little thing done out of motivation of love for God, and how God used that in life after life after life for good. You don't realize how much the little things, the little acts of kindness matter. 
And how do you explain a college professor, a tenured college professor, who comes back from this near-death experience, two years later leaves his tenured profession to become a Christian pastor, his wife ends up divorcing him because she's still an atheist and thinks he's crazy. How do you explain that? Jesus. Jesus is the highlight of heaven. And in his presence, nobody wants to live for anything else. It's just like what happened with the Apostle Paul. You know, he was killing Christians, and he's on the Damascus Road on this mission, and it says a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him, the same one. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And friends, in his presence, nobody ever wants to leave, and here's why. You've never had anybody who loves you more. You were meant to be his precious daughter, his precious son. There's no one who knows you better. There's no one who's more on your side. And there's no one that you'll be more excited to see in heaven. Let me close with this last video. Captain Dale Black uh, is a commercial airline pilot, PhD in aeronautical engineering. He's owned multiple million dollar businesses in the aer- aeronautics industry. And I have to say that because when you, anytime he talked about Jesus, he couldn't hold it together because these memories to them are still as real as it was yesterday. And yet when he flew a plane that got out of control into a monument in Burbank, it crashed, all, all passengers died. He came back to talk about what the highlight of heaven was like. Watch this. Did you, did you see Jesus? Later, I did. That was the last thing that happened after going through the city and asking questions and going through at the very last moment, I had been ushered closer and closer toward the light, toward the light, toward the light. The light that's in the center, center of the city. Yeah, and then there was a stairway that was near the glass sea, which it looked like a sea, and a stairway that went up, and a large angel with the most uh, power, if we would say that. And it was clear that he was basically in charge of that stairway. And uh, I just began to communicate uh, to this angel heart to heart. Again, it's hard to say, did we talk? It seemed like it. But then it seemed like we didn't. This communication was, was just impeccably pure. And I began to recognize, I can't go up there. I can't go up. I, I can't go up and still go back. And I was thinking, go back. Go back? What, what, what do we mean? What's that mean? And as soon as I'm thinking, go back, the angel moved just to the side but I looked into the eyes of the warmest, kindness, most wonderful. I knew this was the Son of God. I knew this was my Savior. And all of a sudden, my knees buckled, my legs lost their strength, and I just went down. I couldn't stand. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was not worthy to... St- I was not worthy to stand in His presence. Funny that I didn't feel worthy to be in heaven, yet I knew I was worthy in the early part. I was somehow given this, granted this authority, but I had this supernatural uh, gift that I was worthy. Somebody had done something for me. He had. Yes. And so I'm down on my, just falling down, and I see his feet, and I grab them, and I hold his feet, and I see the scars. And I know this is the Son of God. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. It is because of Him. He died for everybody. It's so cool because the Bible even says, no, I take that back. Jesus said that uh, I have come not to condemn the world, but that the world through me will be saved. And it was because of that. He was, he's not condemning anybody. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life, what sins you've done, including murder. It doesn't matter what you've done. All of it is is forgivable. God can forgive anybody 
of anything. And then we have this free gift that we call salvation. You and I know about it. And that's it. what you felt and at that's his of feet. Course, like. I just, but to describe this experience, I just stopped at his feet and, and I was worshiping him in, down on the ground there. And I f heard the voice, Dale, do you love me? <laughs> That's it. Do you love me? Mm. And I'm trying to think of all these words to say. And I'm getting ready to say, in a sense, I'm getting ready to say, but I've said nothing. And I'm getting ready to say, of course I love you, Lord. I remember who you are, what you do. I'm getting ready to, to say that. And he bends down and whispers into my ear, and I'm now back. Do you love me? That's the most important question you can answer. And you know, it's really the only one that matters, isn't it? Will you pray with me? God, thank you that that's what you care about most. That you... Uh, you have given heaven to us as a free gift. That that's what Jesus died for. That you tell us that there's only one thing that can keep anybody out of heaven, and that's our pride. Our pride saying, I don't need you. And yet you have made it so easy we can come back into right relationship with you forever by simply acknowledging that we need your forgiveness and we want you to be God of our lives. You won't make us, you won't force us, because love can't be forced, and love is what you want. You know, if you don't know that you're right with God, you can leave here tonight just telling him right now in your heart. He knows everything, every thought, every motive. And just tell him right now in your heart, God, I want your forgiveness, I need it. And I want your leadership, I want what you did through Jesus to count for me. God, thank you that you have made relationship with you simple so that we could walk with you. And for those of us who have had a relationship with you, we want to live lives that are true to what you said is most important, that we would love the people around us with your unconditional love. Teach us how to do that. Teach us not to live for self, but to live for you and to live to serve you and to serve and love people around us so that that day that we stand before you and see our life review, we will feel your joy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks.